Second is entitled God Reigns and Restores. The key verse is Nahum 1 verse 7, which says, The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. The scripture is from Nahum 1 verses 1 through 2, verse 2. The lesson focus the Lord protects and rewards those who trust him. In the overview, it says, when the prophet Jonah preached in the city of Nineveh, the people repented, and God's punishment was averted. But whatever revival took place after Jonah's preaching was short-lived, some time later, God sent the prophet Nahum once again to foretell the destruction of that great city. Nahum had a twofold message, however. The other portion was a message of hope for the people of Judah. God always keeps his promises whether that involves punishment for sin or restoration for God's people. In the introduction, it says, For a parent, which is more important, discipline or affirmation, which is the most important ingredient in a marriage, accountability or trust, which is most helpful to a coach when training athletes, reward or punishment. Obviously, both are needed in each case. Typically, however, we emphasize one at the expense of the other. A parent may be either too permissive or too demanding. A spouse may fall into the error of being too trusting or too controlling. We often cast God in the same light, emphasizing either his strict justice or his loving mercy. Most people feel alienated from God, believing that he is only demanding, harsh, and judgmental. Today's lesson reminds us of the good news that God is both just and loving. While he punishes sin, he also graciously rewards and protects his children. In part one, it says God is jealous of our attention. The text is from Nahum 1, verses 1 through 6, which says, A prophecy concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkoshite. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and vents his wrath against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm, and clouds are in the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and dries it up. He makes all the rivers run dry. Bashan and Carmel wither and the blossoms of Lebanon fade. The mountains quake before him, and the hills melt away. The earth trembles at his presence, the world and all who live in it. Who can withstand his indignation? Who can endure his fierce anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. The rocks are shattered before him. More than a hundred years had passed since Nineveh had repented in response to the preaching of Jonah, the reluctant prophet. Jonah had found it fruitless to argue with God's love for Nineveh. He finally obeyed God's call and delivered a prophecy to the Ninevites. They repented. Both Jonah and the Ninevites were reminded of God's jealous love. While in the belly of the fish, Jonah reflected, those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. Yet the Ninevites slid back into their sinful ways. They returned to the worship of idols and even taunted the worship of Israel. God's prophecy weighed heavily on Nahum as he described God as jealous and avenging, filled with wrath, slow to anger, but great in power. God will surely take action against those who persist in rejecting his love. The prophet resorted to graphic metaphors to convey the overwhelming power of God describing him as whirlwind, storm, and clouds. To convey God's invincibility, Nahum conjured the image of mountains quaking and the earth trembling. 
Who can endure his fierce anger? The obvious answer is that no one can. God will have his justice, and nothing can stand in his way. This fearsome image of an angry, vengeful God was intended to seize the attention of those who had turned their backs on God. He is jealous of our attention, and will not allow us to ignore him indefinitely. We are accustomed to thinking of jealousy as a negative thing, yet God is jealous of our attention because he loves us. He is good, and therefore trustworthy. In part two, it says God is trustworthy because he is good, and the text is from Nahum 1, verses 7 through 13, which says, The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. But with an overwhelming flood, he will make an end of Nineveh. He will pursue his foes into the realm of darkness. Whatever they plot against the Lord, he will bring to an end. Trouble will not come a second time. They will be entangled among thorns and drunk from their wine. They will be consumed like dry stubble. From you, Nineveh, has one come forth who plots evil against the Lord and devises wicked plans. Although this is what the Lord says, although they have allies and are numerous, they will be destroyed and pass away. Although I have afflicted you, Judah, I will afflict you no more. Now I will break their yoke from your neck and tear your shackles away. God's justice and mercy can be summed up in the single statement, The Lord is good. While Nahum foretold of certain destruction for the nation that defiled God, the prophet also asserted that God will care for those who trust in him. He is a refuge in times of trouble and cares for those who trust in him. Throughout this portion of the prophecy, Nahum alternated between these two messages, judgment for Nineveh and comfort for Judah. Nineveh and its allies will be destroyed and pass away. God can be trusted to do what is right in every situation, whether that means bringing punishment or mercy. Interestingly, the hardship that Judah suffered was also God's judgment. The prophet, speaking for God, said, Although I have afflicted you, I will afflict you no more, and I will break their yoke from your neck. As the writer of Hebrews reminded us, as the writer of Hebrews reminded us, God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. Jesus, too, imposed a yoke upon his followers. That yoke is easy and the burden light. Following God is burdenless. It is our failure to follow God that brings hardship to us. While the Ninevites were given a second chance after the preaching of Jonah, no such possibility is offered here. God promises to make an end of Nineveh and to pursue his foes into the realm of darkness. This stark, almost gruesome promise is a chilling reminder that it is impossible to defy God forever. Although he is patient, not wishing for any to be lost, there will come a day when God's incredible patience reaches its end. Nahum may have predicted utter destruction for Nineveh, but the prophet's name means comfort. Now he turned his attention to comforting the nation of Judah. In part 3 it says that God will protect those who place their trust in him. And the text is from Nahum 1, verse 15 through 2 verse 2 which says look there on the mountains the feet of one who brings good news who proclaims peace celebrate your festivals judah and fulfill your vows no more will the wicked invade you they will be completely destroyed an attacker advances against you nineveh guard the fortress watch the road embrace yourselves marshal all your strength the Lord will restore the splendor of Jacob like the splendor of Israel. Their destroyers have laid them waste and have ruined their vines. Nahum shifted his message to focus squarely upon the fortunes of God's people. The good news, the Lord will restore the splendor of Jacob. Whatever the destroyers have laid waste, God will replace. This is the best possible news for a people who have lived under the threat of invasion. 
It is a time to celebrate. Like Martha after the death of Lazarus, Judah must now choose to embrace hope. Judah was being ready for its greatest moment. Genesis 49.10 predicts that the scepter will not depart from Judah or the ruler's staff from between his feet until he to whom it belongs shall come and the obedience of the nation shall be his. Isaiah 65.9 predicts that Judah will possess my mountains, my chosen people will inherit them, and there will my servants live. Nahum 1.15 is a dual prophecy, having application both to the ancient people of Judah and to the church today as we carry the good news of Jesus Christ to the world. There was no better news for Judah than to hear that its oppressor would be completely destroyed and that there would be peace. Likewise, there can be no better news for our world than that the Prince of Peace has come to bring salvation for all people. Just as God completely destroyed Nineveh, so he has promised to completely destroy our enemy. Like the first hearers of this message, we live in anticipation of that great and final victory when Christ returns.